tonight's presenters would we are joined this evening and we welcome from Royal Wharton Bassett Rugby Club Chris Elias. We have from Oswald Street Rugby Club Stuart Johnson. And we also have from the Happy Ocean Company Sally Cornelius and Emma Steele. So we'll be hearing from a couple of clubs uh, to begin with and then also the Happy Ocean Company who are working with the RFU on some of the work we're exploring in this area. Um, so looking forward to these folks talking to you this evening. There will be an opportunity for questions. After each presenter, I will open up and if you've got a question, type it into the chat. And what I'll do is I'll read that question out and so the presenter has an opportunity to respond to you. We'll keep a quite a tight time frame on that. So if we've got more questions than we've got time, we'll try and come back to them either at the end or if we don't have time, what we'll do, we will take them away, we'll respond, and in the follow-up email, which I'll send to you, I'll answer and we'll have all of those questions answered for you. And in the follow-up email, just so you're aware, I'll send you the slides and also a link to the recording as well, so you don't have to worry anything about that. Um, as I mentioned, we've got a couple of polls tonight. Uh, they're in uh, Sally's presentation and Alex, my colleague, will talk to you about those. Please do get involved and you'll see the various uh, options that you can choose on that. Just uh, a couple of final things from me. Uh, the first one is we want to let you know um, we've got uh, additional support available for clubs who are serious about any renewable uh, energy projects. Uh, we have a couple of volunteers who were doing some work with who are helping clubs. Uh, they've done significant developments in their own clubs in terms of renewable energy, carbon reduction, really looking at uh, how their clubs can best benefit from that. If your club is quite serious about this type of project, then I'll ask you to come back to me and I'll, I'll put more details in the email but come back to me on the email and we can pick up the conversations and as I've mentioned on the slides there uh, they help you reduce your energy costs and carbon footprint there's no commercial interest there are two volunteers who've done phenomenal jobs in their own clubs uh, totally independent and any cost for their time and so on is covered by ourselves so that's going to be enough from me. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to Chris from Royal Wharton Bassett. So I'll stop sharing my slides and allow Chris to share his. And I will, wait, wait one second while I stop. And Chris, I'm going to hand over to you and you can share. And whilst okay. Chris does that, we'll just wait for you to start. Uh, sharing chris and I'll, I'll let you do that there we go is that all clear we're all good thanks chris brilliant okay well thank you thank you martin and uh, good evening everybody um my name is chris elias i'm the chair of royal and bassett rfc and what i thought i would do to this evening is give you a sort of an overview of a of a sustainability journey that the club has uh has embarked on over the last 15 years or, or so and it started, I'd say, 15 years ago when we were lucky enough to negotiate the sale of our former ground, at least all interest that we had. And we were given sufficient funding to acquire the a long lease of the town council's football pitches and chain, changing room facilities and sufficient money to, to build a brand new clubhouse. And it's that clubhouse that you can see on that on that first slide there. And as I'm sure if anybody who's been through this process before would, would recognise when you come to do something like this and you have a sort of an, a whole club survey, you get loads and loads of different ideas in terms of what people what people want, you know, and, you know, we've had various suggestions of, of numerous gin palaces with bars for committee, bars for players, balconies, all sorts of things, uh, huge huge cost implications but what we what we decided on rather than having it you know a huge facility we would we would cut back on the size of it but we would we would go for for quality in terms of quantity in terms of the development that we um that we that we produced and you know that was that was the buzzword for us really you know going back to the initial design e even you know we uh we in fact we pinched the design from a local business business park and work with a with an architect who built this building before so we have a building that's 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 light 
airy. It's a pleasure to be. It's a pleasure to be in. We try to make the greatest use of natural light that we possibly can. It's a south southwest facing uh, a building. Uh, so you know, again, looking at how we could save it, uh, energy lighting costs in the future, you know, we can see that we've got this great big glass wall, effectively a gable end, which has uh, tremendous uh, uh, light shed into the into the clubhouse. But what we what we did was, you know, we didn't scrimp on on that design. We made sure that there were reflective coatings and all on all that glass work. So. Um, in the summer, it didn't become like a greenhouse inside. It was um, it was reflected, so we didn't have huge air conditioning costs to keep the place cool. Triple glaze, so in the in the winter, we keep the heat we keep the heat in again, keeping our keeping our co keeping our costs down. Um, and we were we were conscious, really, apart from the sort of the you know the, the environmental, ecological, sustainability aspects of this building. It had to be financially sustainable for us as well. Really, it couldn't just be working on a Saturday and Sunday each uh, each day during the season. It had to had to work seven days a week a week for us, and that meant you know it had to be an attractive space where we could hire out for corporate functions, wakes, birthdays, weddings, what whatever it might be. And indeed, you know it's a it's a seven days a week, fifty two weeks of a year for, year facility. You know it was designed as an attractive space. It's open plan. It can be divisible if you if, if need if needs be. We ensured it had great AV lighting facilities, all these quality um, items that would make it financially sustainable and and indeed produce the profitable return that we require to produce sustainable rugby. The you know the clubhouse had to had to do that. In terms of fixtures and f fixtures and fittings, you know, we we chose the best carpets we possibly possibly could, so they you know they uh, they retained their quality. They didn't wear out. They're cleaned every every quarter to the so that they may maintain to a certain standard. The uh, furniture that we use is of you know as you'd expect to see in a hotel in, in environment. You know, it's a challenge keep, <laughs> keeping it cl clean and tidy on a weekend, admittedly. But, you know, if you want to have that financial sustainability during the week, that's what you've got to do. Anyway, and even down to little things like the bar, you know, where we where the bar was made of cor Corian. And it looks as good now as it did 10 years ago. You know, it doesn't chip, it doesn't stain, it doesn't mark. You aren't going to revarnish it. It's a, fant it's a fantastic facility inside. Energy saving wise, we made sure that we had LED lighting all the way through. Everything was driven by uh, PIR sensors. As I said, we uh, you know monitor the air conditioning as best we as best we we can to make sure that 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 the club is as sustainable as possible. So that was the, that was the that was the new bill that um, that we that we did. But then we also had you know a set of ten historic changing rooms. Which were, uh, you know, they were in, the reason why the town council used to, wanted to get rid of the place, really, because it cost them so much to to run. You know, the the boilers in the changing rooms were like electric immersion heat heaters. They cost a fortune to run, so we up, upgraded those. Uh, we we're onto L, LPG because that was the most cost effective heating source that we could we could run at the time. Again, we upgraded all the lighting in the changing rooms again to LEDs with PIR, so when they're not people in there. The lights aren't on all uh, all all weekend. All the showers and taps were all upgraded. They all have timers on, so then they, you know they're not left running at all the time. Uh, on all the toilets, we installed water my water misers. I was I was staggered to find out that the toilets, all the urinals, all flushed every quarter of an hour, all day, every day. So you know the amount of water that we were get we were getting through was absolutely phenomenal. So we've had misers in now. So you know they they flush when people when people use them, and we've saved a fortune in terms of uh, in terms of in terms of water. We've also you know uh, looked further ahead then, and we've made numerous changes in terms of the t in terms of the two buildings. We were lucky enough to pick up a couple of couple of grants, and we've installed solar PV on on one of one of the buildings. That's a forty-eight kilowatt array that we have on the uh, on the roof. That saves approximately twenty tons of CO two emissions in a year. And what we were able to do, and obviously I don't need to tell you what the electricity costs are like at the minute, but our pay our payback on full cost was three and a half years on those on those solar PV panels. Current pricing, we'll 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 
make them pay for themselves within within two years. They, they, they've been a, you know a phenomenal benefit for us. We've introduced EV charging points in our in our car park. Again, we employed a company, so we've done that on a no no cost basis, and we um, just get a twenty percent percentage profit that the uh, that the things make. And, and the benefit for us really is that do, during the day we can we we are we are paid at our normal commercial energy rate, but during the day we can use our solar PV to feed into those solar charging points, and we earn you know significantly from it. Other little, you know, nice to do things. You can probably see there's a little little wood in the back of our clubhouse. We've installed four beehives. We make our own honey. We, you know, make about 10, uh, 10 jars of single source honey a year, which we which we flog and we give away to our sponsors uh, and the key people in the in the club. You know, it's it's an it's a nice to do thing as a being an in us a in us a fortune. But what it does do is it gives us a tremendous environmental credibility when outside parties look at us and I'll come on to this a bit in a, in a minute really we installed we've installed a clothing bank which supports the Wiltshire air ambulance and apart from saving us a great amount of time in terms of all the lost property that we that we have that we can put into, into the clothing clothing bank when we sell ourselves to the uh, to the local business community which we which we have to which we have to do to make sure that we are sustainable these little things like Making our own honey, um, supporting local, supporting local local charities, all give us a vast amount of of credibility uh, when it when it comes to the f facility that we that we operate. Little little tiny things, but they do mean an awful lot when you're talking to to new sponsors, new clients, uh, corporate hirers who, who can come in and they can see that we're doing all these nice little things. And as a result, they'll come and rent our space as opposed to rent in the Hilton space or something or something like that. So small, small little things, Martin, but they've made a tremendous difference for, for us. Thanks, Chris. That's uh, fantastic. And uh, I, I know the club, it's not a million miles away from me, and I've seen some of the work that they, they have done and continue to do. If you do have any questions for Chris, uh, please pop them in the chat. We have one that's come through. Um, but if there are any other questions, and if you can't think of a question now, when I send the follow-up email and you think, oh, I really wanted to ask Chris uh, something about their beehives, whatever, then please just pop that as a reply and I can always pick up with Chris. But uh, Chris, first question, and we'll just take this before we uh, move across over to Stu from uh, from Oswald Street. But um, John Austin uh, up in Tyndale has asked, um, could you give a little bit more information on the EV charging arrangement? Uh, so you just touched on that. So just tell us a little bit more about, you know, who that was and so on. Okay, well, uh, John, was it was it John? Did you say Martin? Yes, it was John. Uh, yes. John. Hi, John. Yeah, well, it was a company we use called e EVC. Uh, basically, they came in, they did an on-site survey for us, and they were able to offer a package which is which is basically a nil cost package. So they will they will pay for the install of the EV EV chargers. We've got uh, we've got the infrastructure for six. We've got two installed at the present time, uh, and depending on the success, we can have four four other units put in. Uh, so, the the tariff that they use is our existing electricity tariff, which we share with them, and then they add a margin. They add a margin to that. So, we are recompensed via via a meter system in terms of every, all our electricity which goes goes into the system. And then, in terms of the in terms of the margin, they take an eighty percent cut on that, and we take and we take twenty percent. It's a twenty. It's you know, it's a twenty year agreement. So you know, both you and they need um, satisfaction that you've got security of tenure in terms of what you do. But we thought really, as you know, it was going to cost us absolutely nothing. We were going to get a twenty percent return of any just any electricity that was was used, and we had a fantastic facility to uh, to offer people who came to the club and particularly weekends now you know you, you particularly if you're playing in regional league rugby and you've got people traveling from all over Cornwall or whatever it might be to have the facility of an EV charger so that people can know that they can get home with a de degree of certainty is uh, you know is a, is a great shot in the arm for us really works well brilliant uh 
Chris, there's a number of questions come through. But, uh, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to do the first two, the next two questions, because I think they're quite short, and then we'll, we'll move on to Stu, and I'll come back to them. So it may well be we get time at the end, but if not, I will take them away. So uh, all those who've asked questions, don't uh, worry. Um, just a quick one. Solar panels, risk from ball impact. How was that mitigated? Um, I think you spoke to me about this, so quick, quick one on that one. Uh, well, uh, well, I think the the standard of the solar panels, no, they're 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 pretty pretty robust, and the company that we use, a company called My, My Power, uh, you know, assured us there would be there would be no problems, and that and there haven't been any problems with it, so uh, um, no concerns as far as we you know we're concerned on that. Fabulous. And next question, I love this one. Um, the club sounds lovely. This is from Jack. Is the beekeeping done by a member or an external source? <laughs> We it, it it was um, set up by by um, a relative of our past pre president who charged us, but as with all these things, a member came out of the woodwork and said, "Well, actually, I've, I well several members came out actually and said that look, I've got my own beehives, I make my own honey, I'll do it for you." So now it's 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 done gratis by a by a club member. Fabulous. We've got a few more questions, but I'm going to jump on because otherwise we, we, we will run out of time. So we're on a tight ship tonight. So, Chris, if you can stop sharing, that's wonderful. Uh, and whilst you do that, um, Stuart, I'm going to sort of uh, tee you up. So we've got Stuart Johnson joining us now from Oswald Street Rugby Club. Uh, Stuart, if you can uh, get your screen ready to share and then I'll hand straight over once your screen is up and ready. And over to you. Hi there. Thank you, Martin. Um, good evening, everybody. So I'm a volunteer at Oswestry Rugby Club. Um, I've got a, an agricultural background. And I think my, my, one of my main points of interest within the club is now uh, the grounds. Um, I'm sort of coming at this from a slightly different angle in that we're we haven't had funding or grants or anything. So my motivation really uh, is looking for money, looking for grants and um, creating a sustainable future for our, for our club. So first of all, I wanted to really sort of gain a good understanding of what sustainability was. Um, I obviously was looking at the economic factors initially and then discovered that there were three pillars to sustainability, um, those being societal, um, environmental and economic issues. Uh, I looked into the drivers behind corporate and social responsibility, trying to understand what was forcing businesses to adapt the policies and criteria that they were doing and applying those to grant applicants. So in understanding that, I, I looked into um, what the UN were doing and how in 2015 a group of world leaders agreed that they were going to try and create a more healthy um, and thriving planet, taking into account people's uh, rights and well-being. And they set up 17 different goals uh, that they hoped to achieve by 2030. So basically, I then looked at how many of, the, of these goals that I thought we could actually support. Out of the 17, I think we can get to 17 with a bit of wriggle room. Um, what I'm gonna do is tonight, I'm just gonna focus on seven of those and how we're applying those to sort of stage one of our um, grant process. So our little club, um, it's a bit like a prop forward. The, the grounds are always hungry and continually need feeding. There's a reason for that, our, our grounds lack uh, organic matter, they've got a location exchange capacity, so they, they, they struggle to hold nutrients. Um, so for that reason, they are, they are quite expensive to maintain um, and keeping up a high playing standard is, is quite difficult for me as one of the guys is, that looks after the grounds. So coming from an agricultural background, um, Back in the 90s, I'm sure my age now, uh, I was introduced to a project called the Allerton Project. The Allerton Project was a farm that was, was based on a farm that was donated to the Game and Wildlife Conservation Council. 
Um, I was working with an oat miller at the time um, and looking at how we might set up uh, contracts that were linked to the environment. Um, I was introduced to these guys and basically was a bit blown away by the work that they were doing. So there were five principles to how they would like to see farming done. Um, they were looking at sort of environmental and also public and health benefits. Uh, basically, what they were trying to do was set up a, a method of farming nature and, and using nature to benefit farming. So uh, by using the right sort of diverse methods, they were creating a more productive, more um, let's say less impactful method of farming. So I sort of, I took their, their principles and thought, right, okay, can I apply these principles that I'd learned about um, to the way that we sort of manage our club? So I looked at, we looked at the club. Uh, we looked at the areas that we've got available to us. Um, I basically sort of came up with a, an idea of, of, trying to max out sort of trying to sweat our assets as such so where we've got um, embankments and gradients of, of of land that weren't necessarily sort of any use to to actually play rugby on I thought right okay could we um, use them for for other things so there's an area that that we, we, we we've we've allocated to a well-being area there's another area that we've we're planting wildflowers into um we actually got got a sponsor to to um fund that they're, they are wildflower um producers but they're also uh producers of game cover and other sort of environmental mixes for farmers as well um we've we've got um fruit trees and, and things that, that we've planted. Um, I did have the idea of, of, of having beehives, but I was advised against that, Chris, um, in terms of the safety and, and potential swarming. Um, but I love that. That's something that I'd, I'd love to try and sort of engage with. So I might talk to Chris about that afterwards. Um, but basically we, 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 we thought, right, okay, so we, we what, what, could we do with all of these areas that we weren't actually using? Um, carbon capture came into it, and I've recently sort of found out about um, habitat banks and how um, corporate businesses are actually trying to buy areas of natural habitat um, to basically, um, let's say, back up the 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 environmental um criteria etc that's something i'm still looking into but yeah we've we've basically tried to cover lots and lots of different different elements of um let's say natural recovery um and environmental um elements of 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 yeah let's just say the environmental challenges that we, we're all facing um through our club so, Was trying to, to trying to meet that um so let's just move forward a bit so our latest project or the, the, our initial project at the moment we, we made applications to the town council we made um, secure up to seven thousand trees and hedgerow plants to plant around the club um, these will form uh, a hedgerow that will secure our boundaries, uh, but it will also potentially capture around, once established, we think that it will capture roughly around 11 tonnes of carbon per year. Uh, so if you think about when, when you're writing a grant application and you can put these sort of, these, these, these facts and figures into that grant application um, with some, credibility and with some science behind it 
uh, your, your, your grant application is, is going to be looked at upon much more favourably. But one thing that I th I'd really like to push quite, quite, um, one, one factor that I, I think is important to push is the fact that this is this has all been free. The only fuel that we've, uh, the, only, the only cost that we've actually incurred to date is the fuel that, for the man that we, we went up to actually collect some of these trees in, um, which I still owe one of our club members for. Uh, but I've got the line down there, you know, this this doesn't have to cost the earth. I was trying to sell the, the, the whole concept for committee. And obviously, you know, most rugby clubs are challenged financially. I didn't want this to incur any costs, but by sort of talking about the, the, the benefits to the environment and, and how this might help us in a grant application, I got some of the naysayers and more negative people um, on board with this. You know, we look at the environment that we're currently experiencing. We've just experienced the wettest February on record. We've had more pitch. Uh, games cancelled than we've ever had before um you know we look at the pressure on our grounds you know there, there, there are things that are happening around us that are, are quite obvious um in terms of the, the the extremes of weather that we're seeing and i think that you know we, we we all have to sort of respect the fact that this is happening for a reason um so we we are uh, engaging in lots of different things. So in terms of our energy usages, um, you know, our bills are, are, are massive at the moment. Um, Chris alluded to that earlier, but, you know, we're, we're still on this, the, 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 we're still at, a, at an embryonic stage in terms of grant application, but we're looking at replacing our LED, uh, sorry, our, metal halide uh, floodlights with LEDs. Uh, we're looking to lessen the pressure on the pitches by rotating them. There's a picture in the bottom right-hand corner of the slide there, where we're gonna move things around a little bit, but we, we're, not, we're not gonna spare any of the ground. Um, anything that's spare that we can't use is gonna be put back to na nature recovery, well-being areas, um, Biodiverse areas, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and those that can be used, we maxed out and rotated properly, so we're not putting too much pressure on any single area. Water harvesting is something that we're looking at. Um, we've got a huge clubhouse. The, the runoff of that is massive, so if we can use grey water for anything um, within the club, then we will do. Stage three. That's. Where we get from that, that sort of stage is, is be a couple of years away. Um, we've been talking to machinery manufacturers, we've been talking to um, consultants with regards to how we, we might look to produce energy. Um, I, I think that, that that's something that you know we're looking for more guidance on. We're by, no, by means of, we're not really experts in any of this field. I think that, you know, when, when Martin mentioned earlier that there were people that we could um, call upon to help us with this, I mean, my ears picked up. Uh, so, yeah, we, we basically, what we're trying to do is, is, is create an environment that is, it's, it's changing the, 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 negativity and, and and the nat natural decline um oh, sorry i've just got a message up, up there saying my, my internet connection is unstable so i'll push on really quickly so basically we're, we're trying to move with the un and meet their targets we're trying to meet our, our county council's targets etc cetera, etc cetera, um by moving into a nature positive uh area by 2030 and actually we've, we've got this ambition in place whereby we want to move into a, 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 an energy provider by 2030 uh, as a club um, rather than an energy consumer too. One thing that's been apparent in our journey is 
the relationships that we have with those around us have been so, so important. So the support of our town council, local businesses. Um, we've called upon the Wildlife Trust uh, for, for guidance um, and Oster Street Beekeepers Society as well. Um, and we've learned so, so much in a tiny, tiny space of time. Um, but we've also managed to action so many things in such a short space of time too. So, yeah, we, we, we're, we're quite new to this, um, but what we've managed to, to well, the, the making is, is massive already. Uh, we've got this coming weekend, we've got a massive tree planting um, event on at the club. Uh, that's involving club members, children, old members, vets, etc. You know that that it, it draws everybody in, makes them into stakeholders. Um, but I think one thing we are seeing is that basically that this sustainability thing is it's not just my responsibility or the RFU's responsibility; it's everybody's responsibility. And I think that. If you actually do get out there and do start to talk to people, you don't have to spend thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds on making those initial steps, and you can make a big difference. So, yeah, just remember, it doesn't have to cost the earth. Tremendous. Stuart, thank you so much. Uh, Stuart, Stuart's actually dialing in. He's, he's really... I'll, I'll, uh, is is uh, his efforts for the cause are, are commendable tonight. He's dialing in from a hotel, so he's had. I know he's had a little bit of problem with his uh, hotel Wi-Fi. So uh, we've all had that before. But um, Stuart, there's a couple of questions. I think there was a question come in on the chat. I'm not going to uh, take it up now because we'll come. I'll, I'll let you have a little look, scroll through the chat, and so you can have a little look. Uh, there's a couple of questions I think around uh, trees. But if there are any further questions for Stuart, just pop them into the chat. Not that you shouldn't listen to Sally, <laughs> but um, please do. But um, Stuart, thank you so much for that. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm really impressed with what the guys are doing. I had a good conversation with Stuart, Stuart, and I'm going to go up and have a look at the club myself um, because I think as one of the things Stuart's really touched on, and I love his, his statement of it doesn't need to cost the earth. And we all know the, the resonance of, of that sort of statement. Um, but actually what they have done and also how it, it, it's amazing how one should reach out to private businesses that they want to be supportive. There's, just, there's some great lessons in there. So if you have any more questions for Stuart, uh, pop them through. But what I'll do just in the, in the interest of time, I'm going to hand over to Sally. Um, so Sally from the Happy Ocean Company. So Sally, I'll hand over to you. Thank and, you. And um, let you carry on. I'm hoping I'm sharing. Around about now, <laughs> am I sharing? You, oh, you are on no. your you're on notes, oh, Sally. I'll play from the start. There we go. Am I sharing yes, now? Yes, <laughs> that is great. All Perfect. Good. No problem. Thank you, and thank you so much for inviting us tonight. As as Martin has said, Emma Steele, who's joining me as well. We're both from the Happy Asian Company. We've been working in this space for probably ten years, helping organisations looking at how they can become more sustainable. So it's brilliant to hear the stories from Chris and Stuart. And we've also been very fortunate to visit some of the clubs over the last six months and see what's been going on there. So I haven't got a lot to share with you. So mine will probably summarise a lot that the guys have already talked about. So just a few slides, which I'll take you through, and hopefully that will uh, um, <laughs> give you some questions and there will be some polls, which Alex will support me with, I hope. So... I think Stuart already mentioned it, which is great. When we talk about sustainability with organisations, we very much look at environmental, social and economic. And I think Stuart's already explained that clearly. We often look at the SDUs, which are just SDGs, which you've already spoken about, Stuart, in terms of the sustainable development goals and how they can fit within organisations. But I think it's a lot simpler than that. If we just think about how we can be more sustainable, as you rightly said, Stuart, as individuals, as communities, then actually we can start to make a difference. And I don't think any of this is very new in our thinking. So environmental, it's big in the news. I'm not going to talk about climate change and the impacts on climate change. I think we're all aware of these by now. But 
how can we as clubs as individuals obviously have less of an impact on the environment socially which I think lots of clubs are already very good at how can we look at reaching into our communities give back create pathways in, in, ensure that we have accessibility for all which is an area which I know rugby needs to keep looking at to keep those pathways and keep involvement in our local communities and economic, which is obviously key. And I think most of you obviously have, have obviously spoken about that already and how can we remain economically sustainable? So just to start with the first poll, Alex, I hope this will work. I'm talking to myself. Please, could you answer which element of sustainability do you think your club is doing best on at the moment? So that should be with I'm you hoping now. you can choose more than one or two. So you should be able to access it now. That's it. So I can see people are coming in with their answers. Thanks, Alex. There is an unsure. If you really <laughs> are really unsure at all, um, there is uh, there is that option for you. So have a go at the, the poll. If for any reason you can't see it, uh, you can see the answer on the uh, slide. Please do give us your answer still in the chat function. Um, but there seems to be a clear winner at the moment. I'm just going to give it a, a slightly bit more time. And I'm going to close it in just a moment. So um, hopefully you've had a chance. If not, if you are sort of, you do have that unsure option. So I'm going to close that poll now. And I'll share them results with you. So Fantastic. the uh, top one, Sally, is uh, social, 57%, followed by economic and then environmental. And then we do have someone who's just a bit unsure at this moment in time. That's absolutely fine. No problem. Thank you very much, Alex. That's really interesting and probably not unexpected because I'm very, I, I'm actually based in Twickenham. So I'm very, very aware of the impact of rugby. And um, I think social is very key and there's been lots of roadways. And it's it also interesting to see the environmental, seeing as we're a game that's played outside and um, how the environment is obviously impacting on us as well. So Thank you for that. That's really interesting. And maybe we can ask some questions about that when we have more time, if we have more time at the end. So if I can move on, I think, Alex, you need to unfreeze my the poll. OK, yes, we're there. Just so it. just, yep, yeah, I've got it. Thank you. So I'm sure some of you will be aware or maybe not that there's been quite a lot of talk in this space um, across the rugby community. Particularly, there's been a number of reports and plans that have come up discussing the state of rugby and the future of rugby in this space. There was a lot about, um, obviously, the World Cup in France last year and how it could be a sustainable World Cup. Um, the Olympic Committee has also been talking quite highly about making rugby more sustainable. And as many as you would be aware, I hope that there is a strategy that was released a few years ago from World Rugby, which, again, is based around the social, environmental and economic pillars of sustainability. And as you can see there, also looks at how we can relate it to, obviously, the different stakeholders within rugby. So I think that's often worth bearing in mind. And I think my, my my speakers before me have actually spoken about these things to an extent as well. So this is probably just the, the formalised uh, programme around that or a, a framework around that that's been used. And just to share one other framework that we work very closely on, um, Emma and myself, is um, how we look at sustainability as a whole and what it can mean. So we look very much and talk very much about carbon reduction, decarbonisation, and, and I know Chris was speaking about carbon footprints, as was Stuart, and what does that all mean and people, clubs working towards net zero, etc. Well, I think it doesn't, there's different, there's one definition, but there's different ways of looking at it. But for us, it's about how you can look at reducing your carbon emissions. So they are very much looking at things like your energy and also your gas and how you can try to come off grid and how that links into obviously your circular economy, all the stuff that you need to operate as a club. And of course, the piece that Stuart's just kindly shared with us about biodiversity and how we can use the grounds that we have to create habitat, which could be assisting in sort of carbon capture, which is sometimes known as offsetting. Um, or insetting if you're doing it within your own ground, as well as creating habitats and, and places for the future and community gardens, etc. So I think we'll all agree that rugby and sport as a whole, which is the sector we spend a lot of our time in, has a platform, a massive sphere of influence and a lot of people that we engage with. So we have to look at how we can demonstrate good practice going forward. 
just a little bit, sorry, of the, the, the techie geeky stuff, which again, some of you will be aware of. We look at decarbonisation and we measure it looking at the greenhouse gas protocol and we look at scope one, two and three. Most organisations we probably work at or have been working with recently in rugby are a little bit pretty much looking at scope one, scope two, which is very much, again, centred around in a direct and indirect emissions, which is gas and obviously our energy, electricity and transport. However, we're looking at looking at our supply chains and it was really interesting to hear Chris talking about thinking about where they get procure things from and going for quality and more sustainable materials as opposed to um, not necessarily it doesn't have to be the cheapest but ones that don't last so long and that maybe have no end life to them so it's thinking about that whole process probably I can talk more about that but I won't today because it's sort of a lot of detail but people are looking at their car we all know about carbon calculators and there are things that you can look at Interesting, what I wanted to share with you is um, the Energy Climate Group did this uh, poll during the Japanese World Cup in 2019. So they looked at the different nations taking part in their actual footprint. So we weren't doing very well for the English people amongst us in poll C. Um, so as you can see, we didn't do very well. But luckily in the final, which unluckily the result wasn't for the English people again our way. But we were, had a smaller footprint per capita of tons of carbon emission um, as that result. So I thought I'd share that with you. I could, there's a lot of geeky, happy to answer questions about how you measure and monitor that maybe at a later date. But I will move on because I know that it's a, a Monday evening. So maybe just generally to summarise on some of the pieces that have been picked up already, the decarbonation, decarbonisation piece. So how can we as clubs, with or without premises or leasing premises, be able to look at how we can decarbonize. So yes, as we've already talked about, if you have a clubhouse and you can look at grants and funding, we can look at solar panel, we can look at heat source pumps. And as, as, as we know, Martin has said that there are contacts that can support us in doing that. For others as us, we might not be able to do those things due to a number of reasons. So we can look at obviously transitioning over to more efficiency lighting or green tariffs in terms of our suppliers. Another one that's really simple that a lot of people seem to forget is the importance of the behavioural piece of this and how we can actually encourage people through our signage and our communications to act more responsibility. So simply in terms of switch um, signage on lights, switching off can be very powerful. Um, and then for us that maybe don't even have a clubhouse, how we can influence green travel. So maybe thinking about how we can support our players and our visitors and our visiting our, our supporters our visiting teams when coming to and from our grounds how we can influence them and one of the clubs I spoke at recently there was not much they felt they could do in this space if they couldn't put EV points in or if they didn't have space for a bike rack it wasn't their own premises but they did realize that they could use the power of maybe their messaging to the opponent team or their own players and using their website and their comms to do that so there are things we can do in this space if we don't all have the ability to have a, a new clubhouse um, around the corner. Circular economy, again, just picking up on that, I think it's all about the stuff we need to operate. So in some cases, that will be the footprint of our catering, from the, the cups that we use or don't use, from the food that we supply. Importantly for us at all levels of the game, it's the kit. Where do we get it from? What do we do with it when we're finished with it? And I know that many of you, as I think Chris spoke about, there is a sort of a recycling or second hand sale in order to use the kit. And there's I've got quite a lot of contacts in that place where they'll be taken and used. And I'm sure, I'm sure you do as well. But it is thinking about how once we've procured the stuff we need to operate, then what do we do with it at the end? So what's our waste management plan? How do we recycle, reuse it, repurpose? It. I love the one at Prenton with the rugby ball being used as a flower pot all the way along their driveway to the rugby ground. It's wonderful. But all these things about how we can think about creating that circular economy and what we're doing, it will save us money actually in the long term because we're reusing and repurposing, which is what we have to think. So it's not really a, a new way of thinking. I think it's a, a, an old way of thinking that we need to rebring back in. And finally, I think Stuart picked it up, creating habitats. I think that's really important in terms of how we think about how we can use the space we have. It could be a green roof. It could be a community garden. Beehives, amazing. It could be bird sanctuaries. And we can work with local community groups to do this. And there's a lot of measurements and funding and support in this space as well. So that's something that we can consider. 
And I just want to sort of pick up, and I'm not going to read all these out, you'll be really pleased to know, because I'm obviously conscious of questions and timings, is thinking about how we can just become more sustainable as individuals and clubs and within our community, and how, as I've put in there, we can embed the, it into our culture so that the decisions we make are based with this in mind and that we get our community involved. So some things I've put in there is I think Chris talked about the stakeholder engagement piece he did when everybody wanted a gin bar at the beginning or something in terms of going into his new clubhouse, creating some commitments. It doesn't have to be a formal strategy, as, as Stuart demonstrated, some commitments, some things we could do to, to promote and explain to our community that we do want to reduce our impact on the environment. Um, we do want to ensure that we have a legacy and that we can continue operating as a club in our community for a number of reasons, making sure that we put sustainability sort of as an agenda item. And as we found on our travels, the amount of um, volunteers out there is amazing. And the, the range of skills across those volunteers and knowledge is just something that we need to work on sharing more. And, and webinars like this are really important, I think, for that and creating the resources that we can come and come and go to. Um, I think really all to say on that last piece is just to say about the communication. So most of the clubs I've spoken to, I think you will have websites of some form. Use that as a voice in this space. Use signage, notice boards, newsletters to show where you're committed in this space and what little things, because it is little things that will make a big difference. So I think I'll just ask one more poll. And well, now I'm OK on time, am I? I'm just checking. Um, uh, just one question to you all. Um, is there anything about sustainability on your club's website, like a strategy or green travel plan or anything you currently do to promote the excellent initiatives that many of you are doing? Alex, are we there? Brilliant, Sally. Yep, Am I yep, still here? Stopped. Yeah. Yep. You are still there. We're still here. You're still with they're, me. They're, um, Thank they've you. They've jumped in like very talking quickly to myself. on this one. <laughs> they've jumped in quickly on this one. So we're up to 80% of uh, respondents. That's an easy yes I'll just the last lower. bit of chance. <laughs> um for people to respond so if you haven't done or if you've missed it for any reason please do just give your answer in the chat function there so i'm going to close that poll now was it mainly yes alex sorry because i don't get to see the results my end so the results oh, so, yeah, are brilliant. resounding no oh, 100 percent okay. at this moment in time oh, well hopefully if nothing more from today then you'll think about your platforms to obviously communicate these messages i mean i know clubs have notice boards i know that they obviously send newsletters out to their members so use all those things to to think about all these great things that we've been talking about so I think that's really important. I would have liked to have done the yes, no about the score from the matches last weekend at the Six Nations, because I think I would have got slightly different results from what actually happened, which would be quite interesting. OK, thank you. So just to summarise from my end and just based on all the work that we work with other organisations in sport and further afield, just a few pointers to take away, which I think have already been discussed and are very simple, because I do think being more sustainable is quite a simple outlook, really is considering what we can do with our energy. So thinking about, we've got some great ideas that's already been discussed this evening, reducing waste. So what do we need? How can we reduce it? And if we do need to use it, which we will need certain things in order to operate, how can we obviously get rid of it or reuse it in the most sustainable way? Talking to suppliers, auditing our suppliers, looking at they, if they've got good eco credentials where we can. I know it's often money driven, but there are a lot more options out there than we realize. Making use of outdoor space has already been spoken about. Telling our stories. And I think it was Stuart and both Chris that alluded to the fact that this is a really important place for CSR and attracting sponsors and support in showing what we're doing is, is really important. So I think that's probably it. I'll obviously have to end with... Um, my friend David, which I can't quite read because I've managed to get all these people on the screen instead. But um, obviously we are, after all, the, the greatest problem solvers to, to have ever existed on Earth. In working apart, we are a force powerful enough to destabilize our planet, which is probably the bit of the gloom bit. But surely, and this is the bit that I totally believe in, together we are power enough to save it. And I do believe that innovation and the way that we're working, if we want to do this, we can make some some great changes. And as it said, as somebody has already said, and I think it was Chris, it can be done. And as the saying goes, an individual taking a step is progress, but a community taking steps together leads to real change. So thank you. That's all from me. I hope that wasn't too fast or too slow. And I haven't had a chance to look at the questions yet. Thank you, Martin. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Sally. Um, that was fantastic. Uh, and we've got plenty of time. So you, you 
run through that like a whirlwind. So if you have any questions for Sally, please pop them in there. Um, well, uh, there were some questions which I'll come back to for Stuart. I'll come back to you. But just to add to, to this, this is a, obviously a topic which I think, you know, would I, if I was a, a gambling man, would I say that most people on the call were probably, you know, aware of this, but we, we, we do understand that there are certain attitudes around the whole of society who, who look at this and think, oh, why should I bother and so on. Um, and there's been a number of reasons outlined tonight which are really positive. And one for me, which I think is something worth touching on, is is those future generations that I think they call them Gen Z and Generation Alpha, um, which are the, the sort of 10 to 12 year old kids. And, and it's becoming such an important thing to them. And in terms of our game appealing to young people, um, I think there's another thing to consider there that you know we have a we have a role to play within that society, and we know how proud we are of our rugby clubs of what they can do. Every single one of us on a Saturday and Sunday afternoon talk about the amazing stuff we do and how many children and adults we've got playing and so on and so forth. And these stories up and down the land. So I think it's it's really crucial that you know this topic is at the forefront of, of, of everything we're just sort of doing, but staying on agendas, as Sally said, and having that uh, communication piece. So uh, there's a couple of questions which I'm going to come back to. Uh, and if there are any further ones. So, um, sure, I've got one for you. I don't know if you can answer this one, but how much land was needed for the 450 trees? So uh, the 450 trees are made up of mainly uh, small whips, so they're 60 centimetres tall, single stem um, uh, plants. Uh, we have 772 metres of hedgerow going in that's being planted at a depth of three trees per every 60 centimetres, I believe. Um, so that, that takes up a hell of a lot of what of that allocation but we've also got sort of um, standard trees or signatures that will go in specific areas around the club so there'll be clumps of silver birch we've got rowan we've got hornbeam um, we've got trees that will sort of sit in uh, let's say the the, the in in statement areas around the ground um, I think that's the correct terminology. I hope it is. Um, so yeah, there's 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 going to be a, 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 an area that is quite deep on an embankment. Um, we've already populated a lot of that with apples, uh, apple trees, pear trees, plum, and damson for the gin makers that are out there. Um, so yeah, the, the 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 area doesn't have to be massive. Um, you'll actually find that. Uh, hedgerows will capture more carbon per square meter than uh woodland will so if you're at, uh, if you're actually after carbon capture um you can really get that quite quickly and easily through replacing your fence lines with hedgerows um that's something that, that we aim to do um so yeah if you're thinking about replacing your wire fencing at all don't spend money on wire put some put some hedgerows in <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, Martin, uh, word of warning yes, there. Chris. We did exactly the same. Planted 600 whips to create a hedgerow front in a uh, front in our road, road front and a wildlife corridor. Great, all got all volunteers in to do it. A couple of weeks later, somebody came along one night and nicked 400 of them. Oh my. <laughs> so beware. Oh my. <laughs> if you're planting whips, beware <laughs> who's out there coming along to pinch the bloody things. Gets. Uh, yeah. Get some security in. That uh, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was say, oh, we're, we're, not, we're not short of a few heavyweights to sort of yeah. guard, are we? But, but that's, that's, not, that's terrible to hear. I know. Exactly. Really there we are. Word of warning. And the okay. hedgerows are also so good for wildlife and diversity within that as well. So they, they tick lots of boxes at once. So it's brilliant. Excellent. I'm conscious of time, but I'm going to keep running. So, um, Stuart, there was, there was another question from Emma, actually, uh, and saying, uh, and I don't know if you can answer this or whether you can hazard a guess, but do you think um, the, the things that you've done so far, do you think they've helped to attract any new members? Uh, I don't know if that's something you, you've measured or you can feedback on. I, we haven't got any sort of metrics on that at all, um, but 
I know that we've attracted the attention of our neighbours um, and people within the community. So the, there's a, a, a lady who goes past on a, a on her motorised scooter. She's disabled. She takes photos as she's travelling around the boundaries of the club. Has spotted specific moth species and things over the years, but she's never really interacted with anybody at the club. Um, she saw us planting the apple trees recently and stopped and started talking to us. Uh, we started talking about what we we're doing and her engagement, her level of engagement was fantastic. And she, she really sort of offered lots of advice on the moth species and other, other um, aspects of, of wildlife that we hadn't thought about. Um, and following her, there was another lady walking a dog who also stopped to comment on what we were doing. And I think the community side of things is is probably as important as as having those extra members and players on your list, um, because you want stakeholders, don't you? You want people who are buying into your actions, and that spills over. I'm sure it spills over. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Um, a couple of more questions, and I'm conscious of time, Andrew. You Andrew, your comment and your question around the, the balance of investment and, and the comment around league fixtures, I'll take that back. I'm going to take that back to our, uh, feed that back to our uh, competitions guys and so on. So I'll take that to relevant people and come back to you on that one. Um, and I'm just conscious that we've got sort of one minute and I think it's, it's I'm going to leave it with Sally to answer this question. Sally or Emma or Chris or Stuart, but Sally, I'm looking at you. Um, and I'm going to say, what's the simplest step any club could take tomorrow. But before you answer that, I'd open that question out to all of you. And so if you do have an answer, pop it in the chat, what the thing is you think you can do. So having listened tonight, is there one thing that you think as a club you can do? Um, so just type away, no matter what that is, you know, put something on a notice board. doesn't really matter how big or small it is. Just try and pop that into the chat. That'd be great to hear. So Sally, I'm going to sort of tee you up while people hopefully okay. just pop some things into there. So one simple step. One word. Before, yeah. <laughs> one word. Well, for me. One word. If, yeah. <laughs> I don't think you can do one word. You, you and I together could never do one word. So <laughs> pop, pop anything in the chat that you think you're going to do and you know you want to try and do from what you've heard tonight and what you've seen tonight. But Sally, uh, from yourself, what do you think? I think you just need to talk to each other. I think the communication piece, just have a look at what you've got and what you can do. Just seriously, if you've got, because we're talking here, I'm sure there's clubs on this call that don't even have a clubhouse or don't own it. So before we go into obviously that energy side, I think, sorry, it's more than one word, Martin already done. But I think talk to each other, look at what you can do and consider all three elements of sustainability when you're thinking about those things. Is that okay? Sorry. I've got more, but I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. And I like the volunteer champion that's just come up because I totally agree with that. It's really supportive. Yeah. And I think the, the thing to sort of almost end on is, is a thank you to, to all the uh, folks who've presented to us tonight. You know, and, and without wanting to sound too twee, um, you know, this is just a journey we all go on. And it's something that we can hopefully keep moving and pushing. And then there's a number of comments around volunteers. And, and we all know the pressures. I'm a volunteer at my own club. I know how difficult this can be. Um, but I would hope that there are members within your communities in your rugby clubs who perhaps you know if we just a little bit of reaching out we might find individuals I think when I started speaking to Stuart, Stuart said I just wanted to cut the grass and mark the lines and look where he is now um, and I think there are many people out there and I think as Chris has said you know they went out to the membership in terms of bees and all of a sudden you know not sure to get one of three four people come up so don't be afraid to push that out there but um there's lots of questions come through, lots of great ideas there. What I'll do, I'll summarise all the ideas so you've got them. Any questions that we've not answered, anything I need to take away, I will do that. It's it's really, really great to have you all on here. It hopefully, is, well, it, well, it's not hopefully, it won't be the last topic we have um, or the last webinar on this topic, sorry. Um, but it's now two minutes past eight. Thank you for your precious time on a, on a Monday evening. Uh, wishing you all... You know, great success with what you do with your clubs. Thanking the speakers once again and uh, take care, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you.